That's what I was trying to avoid. No, I've had that. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jeremy Shines, and welcome to another episode of Community Conversations. Today is our guest, special guest, uh, my great friend uh, that I can lean and depend on. I've been waiting to get him on the show, and now he's here. Thank God. This is Pastor John Lane. Thank you, Jeremy, and uh, it's a pleasure to be invited. So <laughs> I'm glad we can make this happen. Awesome. All right, let's get started. Welcome to the show, John. Uh, thank you for coming again. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, um, so I am originally from uh, Everett, Washington. Which, for those of you who don't know where it is, it's a it's a town of about a hundred thousand people, uh, half an hour north of Seattle. Uh, pretty much grew up there my whole life. Uh, lived a couple years in Kansas City, Missouri, and uh, lived a couple years in California for a little bit uh, as a youth pastor. Um, but pretty much uh, grew up in the Pacific Northwest. Beautiful, beautiful water, beautiful trees, mountains, snow, all that fun stuff. Uh, love football, pretty much any Pacific Northwest team I love, um, love writing and reading, playing music, just whatnot, and then uh, love working out, love staying active. Uh, I should probably mention that I'm married to a beautiful wife named Angel, um, and we've been married for about 11 and a half years, uh, and stuff, and so, um, but I have three dogs, Parker, uh, Parker Stark and Norris uh, and stuff and so, but yeah, it's pretty much it's pretty much me in a nutshell. Okay, so sounds like your life is very fruitful, and you came to Battle Mountain. Yeah. Why? It was <laughs> <laughs> Battle Mountain. Honestly, is a great place. Uh, it's it's a it's a wonderful wonderful community. Um, so so as you mentioned, I'm the pastor of Battle Mountain the Sunday of God, mm -hmm. uh, and at the time we are about. We've been here five, a little over five years, and I want to say about six-ish years ago, we started wanting to um, become senior pastors or lead pastors of the church. And so um, we sent resumes all around the country pretty much, just saying, hey, we'd love to apply and, and whatnot and stuff. And so, but uh, Battle Mountain actually was, uh, it was the only... Uh, city or the only town that offered uh, to have us come and check it out so we're like let's just jump on it and so we came uh, we wanted a small town we wanted you know because we were my wife and I we were used to the big city we were used to the hustle and bustle and the bright lights we ex we pretty much had experienced everything that you could experience in a big city so mm. we wanted to, to live in a small town uh, and so we checked out Battle Mountain fell in love with uh, just uh, the, the community and the people, and, and we wanted to um, be a part of whatever Battle Mountain was doing at the time. So we, uh, and then long, very long story short, we, we ended up taking the church, obviously, and moved down here, and uh, have been falling in love with it ever since. And you've been here for? We've been here a little over five years. So May, uh, what would that be? Uh, May of 2014. So yeah, yeah, been here, been here a good chunk of time, and, and uh, we're still we're still learning uh, how to live in a small town, you know. But uh, we've been loving every little bit of it, and uh, we've been able to see uh, and meet some amazing people. So that's really cool. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, since I've known you, you you've been very re reserved. I've been reserved. I mean, you're. I mean, I know you now. Yeah. <laughs> but just kind of like you're quiet. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm a natural introvert, uh, to be honest, um, which I think works great in a small town. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, you know, I like going out, meeting people, hanging out with people, doing different things here and there. It's just uh, maybe a better way to say it is my bandwidth isn't nearly as long as some of these crazy extroverts out here. So, um, but yeah, no, no. Well, I, I, I would like to think that I'm more balanced, but yeah, I would say when you met me, I was more introverted. You're a public official, huh? 
No, I'm not a public official. No? No. You're not a pastor? Like... I'm, a, I'm a pastor, but I'm not a public official. What is a public official? So a public official would be like people who work in the government. Which which I used to work for the government. I used to work for uh, the Census Bureau. Um, uh, I used to tell people I was a secret agent for the government, and they gave me a badge and all that kind of stuff. So, but uh, no, pastors are not government officials. Oh. So, um, but I I guess you could say I'm a public figure. I think I think is maybe what you meant. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say people more or less know me um, mostly because of my position and uh, what we do through the church and offering. And what we have to offer our community. So, do you feel in that position that uh, you're treated any different, as well, or how you have to behave? Yes and no. I mean, when you say you're a pastor, there are certain connotations that are tied to that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some good and 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 you know some that help you be able to do what you're called to do. Mm-hmm. Some might be a little exaggerated to a certain extent. Um, you know, which is why you have to always be careful. Um, I, I always have to be careful with how I uh, act or behave in public. But mm-hmm. I would say more or less, you know, I try and be just, you know, an average, regular, regular guy, you know. Um, nothing different about me than anyone else here in Battle Mountain, other than uh, I'm leading a church, you know. But, but there's some things, for example, someone else uh, might experience that, that I have no idea what they go through you know for example the miners you know i have no idea i've never been to a mine mm-hmm. um you know i have no idea what they go through mm-hmm. and stuff and so but but yeah i mean i wouldn't say i get necessarily special treatment um maybe maybe a better way uh, would be uh, i get certain respects because of my position mm-hmm. um but even then you know um, like like no one really calls me pastor here in battle mountain which is fine i'm not i'm not against her for it's just you know calling me john is perfectly fine mm-hmm. um so but just like i said everyone's different and um, you know but it's all good so why did you become a pastor why did i become a pastor that's a great question um it could have been anything else right what would you do if you weren't a pastor? well 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 let's say this there's a common there's a common um saying where where it's uh, pastors are um oh, what is it what is it? I can't remember. I don't want to kill kill your airtime. But uh, basically, oh, uh, pastor is a, is a jack of all trades, but a master of nothing. Mm-hmm. Meaning, we're okay at a lot of things, but we can't necessarily say that we're experts mm-hmm. in something. So, uh, I've done a lot of different things. Um, like I said, I used to work for the Census Bureau. Mm-hmm. Um, I used to be a custodian at a church, uh, a couple churches. Um, you know, I've I've done my duty at McDonald's. Um, you know, uh, I've done little things here and there and stuff and so. But but to answer your first question, why my pastor is pretty much I wanted to help people, mm-hmm. and I wanted to help people find and discover God and who God is. Um, you know, just because of the time that we live in is. Um, it's very postmodern and relevant, and what I mean by that is. Everyone kind of has their own personal truths mm-hmm. and all of that, and uh, and it can be in whatever you want. Mm-hmm. Uh, and growing up, I was always I was very inquisitive. I would always ask questions, mm-hmm. um, but I would always question a lot of things. Mm-hmm. And and um, even in even in my faith, I would question, you know, why God this or why Jesus that or why 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 you know. Uh, and that put me on a great pursuit of who God is and who and what truth is and stuff. And so mm-hmm. I want to help people discover that um, through Scripture, through the Bible mm-hmm. uh, and stuff. And so, uh, but yeah, that's pretty much why I became a pastor in a very very small nutshell. Uh, if I could do anything else, what would it be? Uh, to be honest, I don't really think about that. Um, but if I could just give a quick answer, I would probably be. In either business, some aspect of business, um, or or something in like marketing or, or something like that. Um, you know, I would say that. Dang. Yeah. Um, that was that was a lot. Not not yeah. that it was it was great. This, yeah. This is what this show is. Yeah, I got you. So it's just talking, getting people to understand who you are. Mm-hmm. You know, feel more comfortable, just because you know. Yeah. People don't know each other. Mm-hmm. So, so. I got you. But um, you sound like me. 
I sound like trivia. Trivia. The search uh, for okay. trivia. Part. Okay. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I'm, I'm surprised by that. Yeah, okay. you went black too. <laughs> I, I, no, I'm white. I am so white. I don't think I have a drop of pigment in my entire Mary, life. How, how, you want to tell us how white you are? I mean, <laughs> for, I don't want to say white as snow. Jesus kind of has that thing. But um, I'm going to say printer paper. Like, that kind of white. Right. And so, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, when I was in... Uh, quick, Quick story. When I was in fourth grade, we were studying albinos. Like, what's an albino? And being the kid from Washington, moving to Missouri, my classmates thought I was an albino because I, I was so white. <laughs> that, really? Yeah. And, and our teacher was like, no, John just doesn't go out in the sun. So, but yeah. You don't go out in the sun. I do now. I do. I mean, you know, it's. I mean, growing up in Washington, it rains every other day. It's cloudy. Yeah. Day. So you know, I was kind of around like Seattle was the same. Yeah. 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 And stuff and stuff. Um, but yeah, you almost never go outside in, in Seattle. So the, the inquisitive part is the as far as asking the questions. Mm -hmm. um, I was a Buddhist before I became a Christian, mm -hmm. and. The things in the Buddhist faith didn't make sense. Yeah. Like, there were certain things there, but there was always another question, another question, another question, another mm -hmm. question. And I would ask another question, and I'm like, this doesn't make sense. And as soon as I ran across someone who was a Christian, mm -hmm. and they answered the question, that was it. That piece of the puzzle was done. Mm -hmm. I didn't ask that question again. Yeah. Or if the question came up, it was on a greater scale. Mm -hmm. and it, and it, but it filled something in me. Mm -hmm. And that's why I pursued and became a Christian. Yeah. Being a pastor, too, is not like being a, just a follower of Jesus. That's what I've noticed. Mm -hmm. Would you say the same? I Here's the thing, because sometimes pastors are put on a pedestal that they should not be on. Mm -hmm. and, and yes, they are called to be leaders. Yes, they are called to lead a group of followers. You know, um, I don't want to diminish that because, yes, 100%. Mm -hmm. um, because... You know, pastors set the tone, they set the standard, and, and how, however, wherever that standard is, mm -hmm. their their people or the people under them that they're leading will only rise to that standard. There might be a few like that raise above it, but not um, too many. Um, but how how I like to refer to it as is, I'm I'm a I'm a disciple, right? I'm a I'm a student of God is pretty much what that word means. Um, in the sense that whatever whatever Jesus does, I want to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm I'm called to make that a part of my life, mm -hmm. similar to similar to every other believer who who is desiring to be a disciple needs to do the same thing. It's just I'm helping lead those people along and with my journey to God or. To God, yeah. So, does that make sense? Right. So, I wouldn't say, like, everyone, you know, if we're talking about the globe, everyone is called to be a disciple of Jesus, mm -hmm. right? That's that's the whole redemptive story. Mm -hmm. uh, that's salvation right there. Um, but pastors are specifically called to to help equip and lead disciples in, in, in growing in their relationship with God. Mm -hmm. So... But we're no different than anyone else. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. okay. That's that's interesting. Um, you know, would you know the difference as far as like, could you could you could you define the argument and separate the? Uh, here's the big theological question: mm -hmm. What comes first, um, uh, uh, grace or works? How do you? Do you know what I'm asking? Are you talking about the dynamic? As far as how they work, is it is it through faith, grace, and then works, or is it works and then grace? Well, first of all, I just want to say this this very topic has been debated for millennia. <laughs> so um, it's even uh, to, it's not debated necessarily in the Bible, um, but it's pretty much since the Bible has been like assembled um, through the through the whole process and and uh, I believe it was the three hundreds. Anyways, don't want to go into history. Uh, but basically, since then on till now, this has been debated. So 
I, I would say this. Paul talks about how um, you you cannot. It's all based on faith. Where do you place your faith? Meaning, where do you place your trust? Okay. Um, and in order to have faith, you have to then experience the grace of God, right? It's not smart to believe in something that you haven't necessarily experienced, right? Mm -hmm. So, so when when you when you um, realize and see your need for God and your need to be forgiven of your sin, and when you see the need that you have to follow Jesus, okay, and let the Holy Spirit lead you. Mm -hmm. um, that's grace. That moment right there, that is grace, which then should turn, you should be able to turn your, the grace that you experience into faith and belief mm -hmm. and trust in God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, all that. And then from there, James, who, by the way, is the half-brother of Jesus, who didn't believe in Jesus when he was uh, alive for his ministry. He didn't believe in Jesus being the Messiah until after Jesus rose from the grave, mm -hmm. right? Um, he he wrote his book uh, that is now in the Bible, and and he said he takes this idea that Paul talks about, and he he takes a step further in the sense of okay, if you really have he we reverse engineers it, in the sense of okay, if you if you say you have faith, where are your works, okay, where where can we tangibly see that you're putting your faith into action? Uh, because faith without works, as, as James says, is dead, meaning it's pointless. It's mm -hmm. like, it would be like me saying I'm a millionaire mm -hmm. when I don't have a million dollars in the bank, mm -hmm. right? That's lying, mm -hmm. okay? Um, same thing is true for anyone who, who says that they have faith in God or faith in salvation or faith in, mm -hmm. in, in, in uh, the gospel message is, okay, where's your works? Show me. Um, and it's not a, it's not a, a <laughs> it's not about law. It's not about following a perfect list of rules. Mm -hmm. It's just the grace that you've experienced from God mm -hmm. should build up your faith mm -hmm. and your belief and your trust in Him, so that you obey the commands and you obey the laws out of your love for God and out of out of the appreciation of the gift and the grace that He's given you. Mm -hmm. So. It's all it's all cooperation. There's no sense of like do this or else. Um, I know some people would debate me on that, uh, which is fine. I'd love to have that discussion. So I have, <laughs> so I have a question for What's you. Um, no one can judge me. This is a question, mm -hmm. but God. Okay. And you're judging me. What do you do about that? How like how would I respond to that? How do you um, take that apart and define it? For what it really is. Well, here's the verse. Okay. Judge not that you not be judged. For what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And the measure you use shall be measured to you. Okay. Why behold the moat that is in your brother's eye when there's a log in your own eye? Uh -huh. Take that apart from me. Okay, well. <laughs> if you can. I, could take, I know you can. Oh, I could take that apart very much. Quick, um, quick, uh, uh, if I remember correctly, that verse is in John 7. It, it's, prob it's in Matthew 7. Is it? Okay, well, it also occurs in John. Yeah. Um, and if I remember correctly, Jesus is addressing generosity or giving. Okay. So this verse, which by the way is the number one most quoted verse in the entire world, it used to be John three sixteen, <laughs> but now it's this one. Um, uh, Don't judge me. That's no. That's I'm a, I'm telling you fact. Tell me the difference between right judgment, righteous judgment, okay. and just judgment. Well, I'm I'm gonna get there. Okay. So so the difference the difference is this. The, the judgment that Jesus is referring to in this passage is, is makes us ask the question of, am I judging you based on what the Word of God says, or am I base, basing my judgment on how good I am? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, like, like, God never in His Word says it's wrong to judge someone in any scenario, right? Because, because we, use, we use judgment calls all the time, right? Mm -hmm. If you... You have two dollars, right? And you say you and your wife want to go out on a date, and you're trying to find a babysitter, right? And there's two options. You have you have the nice, sweet, confident-looking, let's just say, young twenty-year-old woman, right? Okay. And you have some disheveled, doesn't look like 
he has his life together, doesn't look like he mm -hmm. could even take care of himself, let alone two young children. Mm -hmm. Who are you going to pick? Well, I'm going to pick the young lady. Okay. That's a judgment call. Yeah. You're judging these two people, yeah. right? Okay. Now, why Now, why? Why did you pick the woman? Why did I pick her? Because yeah. she seemed more suitable okay. for what we are looking for. Okay. Uh, I'd rather would choose her to raise our children for the short time that okay. she would be there yeah. versus this other person. Okay. Okay. So, so taking that, taking that analogy, God wants us to to look at first of all ourselves and say how are we how how are we doing with following the word of god his word right now that's a dependency right because we're never going to live perfectly for it oh so you're saying when we live our life we go is god is this going to please god is this that's yeah our, that's our trust that's yeah, our yeah. Faith in it versus just doing something outside of whatever that says yeah, but I, well, kind of, sort of. What I'm saying is, 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 am I, am I personally, am I judging the quality of how well I'm doing to God's word, yeah. or am I judging it based on what I think or how I think I should be living my life? Mm -hmm. Now, put project that onto someone else. If someone is doing something mm -hmm. and they're a fellow believer, they believe in God, they've accepted salvation, they're mm -hmm. following Jesus. If they're doing something that is contrary to the word of God. Then we have, out of love, right? God talks about doing everything in love. Mm -hmm. We are actually morally required to say something to them mm -hmm. so that they don't continue to sin. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's holy judging. That's biblical judgment, okay? Versus me saying, hey, you're doing this wrong. I'm doing it better. You should be like me. That's wrong, mm -hmm. right? Um so judgment, I mean, if, if judgment were wrong, right, if, if judgment was ungodly, why do we have the gift of, of discernment, right? Discernment is the ability to know what to do, when to do it, how to do it, right? Why would we have wisdom, right, which is how to properly apply knowledge, right? If the, these are gifts of the Spirit, right? And I know I'm going really deep right now. But, but basically, if God ordains these through the, through the Holy Spirit, then we have to be able to use them properly. If we can't judge and assess based on the word of God mm -hmm. and it be holy, we can't use these gifts. So on that note, us as Christians, mm -hmm. followers of Jesus, yeah. we, uh, by God's grace, we are able to obey the law. Yeah. Um, kind of like I just I was talking to a friend mm -hmm. that I met through my brother okay. that I'm talking to, okay. and he said, well, I said, it's like a cop pulls you over, right, for yeah. breaking the speed limit. Mm -hmm. And by his grace, he's putting confidence in that person to do the right thing the next time, mm -hmm. right? But if there's a difference between that and actually just abusing grace. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Paul talks about it in Romans, right, where uh, if you ever want to study salvation, read the book of Romans, okay? Uh, but yeah. Paul talks about how when we misuse grace, we're re-crucifying Jesus mm -hmm. over and over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, in some translations, it says that we're not to use grace uh, as a weapon, right? Like we do something that we know is sinful, but we do it anyways. And then we pray and be like, hey, God, you have, you're forced to now forgive me. Well, that's an abuse, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that can rabbit trail us for a long time. But basically, yeah, we're not meant to use grace as some sort of get out of jail free card because we also need to remember that yes even though there is grace we're also going to be judged by god when everything comes to a to a a climax if you will and so you know we need to be aware of that now will we have to if we've accepted jesus will we have to pay for those sins i mean scripturally no but at the same time God also punishes those or he disciplines those he loves. So how far are you willing to take this? Because at some point, God's going to be like, okay, you need to learn this command. You need to learn this lesson. You need to trust me in this so that you stop sinning. So, I mean, God God can definitely in his, in his uh, in infinity um, teach us what we need to learn so that we don't abuse any of his gifts. 
So your study is your biblical study, mm -hmm. your life mm -hmm. um, journey with the relationship with God. What do you think about the people who don't have a relationship with God and they hear what you're saying and they go, I don't want that or I don't, you're judging me. What do you think about that? Mm -hmm. well, I, well, first of all, my heart goes out to them. Uh, I'm sorry they, they feel that way. I'm sorry for whatever has led them to that. I mean, this is why I, I became a pastor was to help people find truth. Um, and I do that out of out of love and compassion, not out of, out of well, I figured it all out because there's so much more that all of humanity doesn't know about God that, you know, I mean, there's, there's always something to learn. So I would first of all say that you know, I, I love these people. I care for these people deeply. Um, on the second, I would say, I would ask them, where is the, where, what is the root of their unbelief? Uh, because because he, here's a misnomer in church world. That, um, it doesn't frustrate me. It just I just wish people would get it. <laughs> is, is this, God doesn't, God doesn't send, God doesn't send sinners to hell. God sends people who don't believe, right? That's that's the crux, right? Because if because if God sent sinners to hell, then we would all be doomed. Salvation would be pointless, right? It's unbelief that ultimately um, does that. So I would I would ask them, what is the root of their unbelief? Is it because they don't know? Um, is it because they you know someone a Christian made them mad and they just swore off God? Is it something that maybe God didn't do or did do in their life that they didn't want that makes them uh, kind of want to get as far away from God as possible? Uh, is it maybe the influences around them it doesn't create an environment for them to believe, right? Um, or I would say, and, and, and just, you know, this I believe is a very small part um, of the equation of are they just believing lies from the enemy, you know? Um, but most of the stuff, most of the unbelief is caused by um, either an experience or we just don't, we're just not in an environment that uh, helps us know the truth. So I would say that. I would also say, come check out, find the truth. Find it, you know, we live in, a, we live in an age where information is at our fingertips. Mm -hmm. You know, get in a good Bible-believing church. Um, you know, one that you can trust, one that... Uh, believes in you, one that wants to help you, one that's willing to answer questions. Um, you know, I, like I said, I don't know all the answers, but if I don't know the answer, I'll tell you, and then I'll tell you, I will find out for you. Um, so, you know, just it's just one of the things where you just got to jump and try it. You have to experience it for yourself. Yeah, I mean, I mean, my, my salvation wasn't, it wasn't an intellectual decision. It wasn't like someone um, beat me over the head with Bible and they won an argument. No, I had to actually, I had to actually experience the presence of God, and I had to actually experience um, the invitation of, of accepting salvation. Um, so, and a, a few pastors and a few leaders had to walk me through that. I also had to read the Bible, um, you know, and, and see what does the word actually say um, versus what do I think it says. You know, um, so there's a lot of evaluation uh, in that aspect. So, you think reading the Bible is important with your faith? Oh yeah. I mean, here's the, here's the thing. Um, yes, Jesus rose from the grave, but he's also in heaven. Um, yes, God exists. Yes, all that, but he's up in heaven. We do have the Holy Spirit. Um, but the beauty of the Word of God, the beauty of the Bible is, is um, it's the Word of God, right? Like, yes, yes, I hear, and I hear this all the time. Yes, it was written by man, but the Holy Spirit guided what they wrote. Um, the people who assembled the Bible, the Holy Spirit guided them in what to put in. It wasn't just some arbitrary process. I mean, you also have to think... Um, you know, name name another book. Name another book that that is written by I think it was thirty five authors. Forty. 
Is it 40? Well, let's see, someone's. I did my research. Okay, you did your research. Okay, cool. So, do you know how, how many centuries? It was 1500 years. Okay. Over okay. the course of 15. Okay. Um, and then, and then, what what were the occupations of the authors? Uh, there were different. Uh, okay, so but can you name just a few? Um, honestly, I don't. Okay, okay. So you have kings. Oh. Okay, you have you have King David, King Solomon. You have fishermen. You have tax collectors. You have rich, influential people. You have poor prophets. Like it's a wide array of people over a whole epoch. Right, a whole moment in time, fifteen hundred years, right? Um, yet the words are—they don't contradict each other. They don't. <laughs> they don't. Wow, that I never. They heard don't. It that way. There's no like, like for example, David doesn't say go right, and Paul doesn't say go left in the same exact situation. No, you do have to read it. You do have to study. You do have to know context. But at the same time, you don't see overarching contradictions um you know and it's because the holy spirit guided the whole process of how uh, he wanted the word of god to be designed i like how you said that poor rich all these different people yeah over the course of time yeah and they never knew each other okay right yeah and their words all line up yeah that's awesome yeah i never you just blew my mind right now yeah yeah, I mean, it's insane. All this, I mean, Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. He was against Jesus, and he got converted, right? I mean, and then you compare him to someone like Moses, who was for, I mean, he wasn't, he was for Jesus, but, you know, he was like many centuries before Jesus. But he was for God, mm-hmm. right? And they're, they're two of the most influential people in the entire Bible. I Yet they were on polar opposites. Right. Yeah. I once... Re- and you buy C.S. Lewis, right? Yeah. And he says, if the Bible is true, mm-hmm. everything else is meaningless. There's nothing more important yeah. than to know the truth. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think he, I don't know, if, uh, I remember something similar to that quote, but I think it's like salvation or something. Right. But yeah, yeah, it's, it's, either, it's either all important or not important at all. Um, you know, it can't just be in the middle of somewhere important, right? Because we're talking about eternity. Uh, Pascal, um, he was a uh, he was a scientist. I can't remember what century, um, but there's a fame. Catholics will know this. Um, there's what's called Pascal's wager, similar to what C.S. Lewis talks about, except what he says is, listen, if it's true, if Christianity is true. Try no, 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 let me back up. He's, he he makes he makes a wager in the sense of try it out. Go to church, read your Bible, volunteer, do your giving, your tithe, be as what a Christian should be. Okay. And here's the thing: if if you if you die, <laughs> is what he says. If you die, and it's all just a fallacy, at the very least, you led a great life. You led a very productive life. You led a very giving life. But if it's true, you just saved yourself from damnation. Mm-hmm. So at the very least, you at the very least you gain a good life on earth. But that doesn't even happen with that concept of the mind. If you just do this, this, and this, as far as just like um, yeah, if okay, if it's not true, then yeah, I I just live live the good life. But if it is true, by the time you look back at it, mm-hmm. you go, you. You already understand that it is true yeah. before you die with that mindset. Oh, I'm just gonna, I'm dying. This is my death day. Does yeah. that make sense? What I'm saying. So, so, just so I understand, are you saying like where is the actual belief? No, I'm saying of the surrender. Okay. I'm saying like if you try it out over time, you'll start to realize it is true. Yeah. And then you won't have that if it's true question anymore. Yeah. You would be like, oh my gosh. Yeah. If you have, <laughs> if you have good believers who believe in you, who want the best for you, who um, who aren't out to just get you because you're a number, right? Because Jesus didn't, yes, Jesus desires everyone to be saved and to accept his gift, but he's not trying to build an organization to build an organization. So if you, if you are around a bunch of good Bible-believing Christians, believers, followers, uh, Scripture calls them God-fearers, 
which mm -hmm. I think is kind of cool. Um, you know, and you just, or they allow you to ask questions and they, uh, and you allow them to just walk you through faith and walk you through belief and walk you, and just basically do life with each other. Mm -hmm. You'll start to see how faith in God actually plays out in life. That it's not just a bunch of to do's and do's and don'ts and all those commands, and that there's actual life behind it. You know, um, the the I think it's Second uh, Timothy three sixteen where uh, Paul says God breathed life um, into His word. It's that word breathe is the same word that. Um, that Moses uses to describe God breathing life into Adam, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so it's the, the Bible is not just any regular book; it's it's a life giving book. And so, if you're willing to go through the process, and if you're willing to actually investigate and seek the truth out, mm -hmm. um, and be around a body of believers who love you and care for you and want the best for you, you'll eventually. Um, start to see what truth actually is. And and that's happened actually in our church. That's happened several times. We've had non-believers who were so opposed to God and Jesus and church and all this stuff. And they started slowly coming more and more and more often. And they started to realize, you know, one day <laughs> they, they came up to me and they were like, John, I'm, I'm so sorry. I didn't like believe earlier and, and whatnot and stuff. And so you just got to give it a shot. Pascal's Razor, give it a shot, see what happens. So, awesome. Yeah. Well, um, that pretty much wraps up our time. Okay. This was awesome. I just, just listening, you're just like pouring knowledge, pouring wisdom and, and grace over through my life. Mm -hmm. I'm just like, that's what it's about. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. And I, and I hope that helped, or I hoped that helped some of your viewers, and I hope right. that answered at least some questions and, and at the very least maybe whet some appetites. To see, um, you know, to check out what, what's this whole God thing and what's this whole salvation thing. So, because mm -hmm. it is, it, um, if you reference this to us, it's the decision. There's no other decision greater than this one. So, every day for me, I'm like, it's not my life. Mm -hmm. It's all about what He wants me to do. Mm -hmm. you know? Exactly. And it's like, yeah, there's challenges. Yeah. You know, lots of them. But I find my strength, my hope. To get up every day yeah. because of his purpose, not because of mine. Exactly. So. Exactly. Yeah. And that's all God really wants is uh we just want you to live for him. And it takes it takes it takes a lot to come to that point. But when we do and when we embrace it, all of a sudden we start to see how good God is. So okay. Awesome. Yeah. Any last things you want to say? Or? Uh well again, thank you for having me. And uh, if any of your viewers have any questions, I'm more than available. Um, you know, and I'm all, I'm always open to questions and whatnot. And uh, just you know, we're, we're here. Battle Mountain AG is a church that loves their community and loves the people in the community. We're not just here just to exist. We're here to actually uh, help and assist and. and bring people into a relationship with God primarily, but we're also here to serve and be there for them. So thank you for that opportunity. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, John. No problem. No problem. Thank you.